Hi everyone, today I am so excited to be speaking with author Sana Krasikov and I have her book here on my Kindle because I was listening to it and doing Whisper Sync, but she has the hardcover which has a completely different cover and I love it. Love it and thank you so much Sana for talking <laughs> thank to you. me about this book. Oh, this book. Oh, Sana. <laughs> <laughs> I love this book so much. And you know what? I usually tell authors, like, I'm like, oh my gosh, this would make a great movie. I, I with this book, it's like a mini series. It's like a, a series. You can't That's do this in funny. a movie. You cannot do this book in a movie. There's no it's, way. It's funny you say that because uh, my agent was like, you know, you should pitch this for a mini series. And, uh, but take out the whole contemporary storyline, the one that's set in 2008, because nobody wants to jump around in time. Said, so, okay. So, but the, unfortunately, people in Hollywood don't want to read a 500 page book. So, I just finished condensing it with his, with him. I mean, he did it, but I helped into a 30 page document. So it's like a 30 page right. summary. And then, the thing, right? yeah, because he's like getting some interest because there's a, I guess, I thought Ru I thought Rush was going to be out of the news when this book came out. Like it was, it was, <laughs> anyway, it's still in the news, you know? So I think like he's getting some interest, but condensed it. So I never thought I could summarize this book in 30 pages, but you know, you do what you have to. <laughs> Because I'm telling you that just to be able to um, go back in the 30s, because, you know, I have to say that my history and I'm all over the place and I love historical fiction, but I really didn't understand what was going on with Russia in the 30s. You don't even when you learn about World War Two, you never hear really about the Russian side of what's going on are very few. There are very few books that I've read that I even even touch on that. Okay. And so it was so interesting to read that part of it, but I did like the 1980s. I did like the seventies. Mm -hmm. I liked 2008. I, I loved it all. So oh, thank I, you. You know, what, what a heartwarming story. And I'm going to let you explain because I've been doing a lot of research and you had a great, um, little thing in the back of your, uh, in the back of the Kindle where it gives the timeline, which really helped me because, mm. you know, like I said, you get the bits and pieces of Russia, but you know, even in my, I'm 53. And so even, you know, I lived during the cold war and Reagan and all that stuff. And, you know, but mm -hmm. we really don't, we, we didn't really get to understand it. They didn't teach that to us. In right. so, and I wanted to show um, that side of life from an American's point of view. So the story, I mean, right. The most the most basic summary is about it's about a group of Americans who are stuck in Russia during the Cold War. So it, uh, Florence finds the heroine, and she in the kind of she's this forward thinking, um, you know, free living young woman who uh, at the height of the Great Depression gets on a steamership, goes to Russia where she spends the next forty years of her life, and at some point she realizes the way back is close to her, but it's not just close because of Soviet machinations, but also because of this sort of complicity under the cover of rivalry that America and the Soviet Union have. So, you know, it's been really interesting to see the, the new cycle and kind of like, you know, the word collusion thrown around because this book is all about that kind of collusion beneath our animosity that has always been part of the relationship of the two countries. And so then she's, then she sort of is this American who has to navigate this world of, you know, fake news and, uh, <laughs> and, and autocracy and political correctness gone awry. And um, it's different than if you were to see it, you know, from the eyes of a city, because she hasn't internalized any of it. She's just like a Brooklyn girl. Right. And then, and then the consequences that decision has on her son, who's telling part of her story in the modern era. So that's the book. Yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, I always think about this, with, especially with um, historical fiction authors, is that the, the amount of research, like, how did you get the research part of, I mean, you know, you go into a little bit of it in the back of your book, but like, even let's just say the orphanage in Russia during that mm -hmm. time, like, how did you find out all that information? So it was it was interesting to listen to your interview with the author of um, Lillian Boxfish because, um, like her book, this was based on the life of a real woman, and it was actually the mother of a very good friend of our family. So um, in 2008, I was just wrapping up my first book, and um, my family and I took a vacation in Cape Cod, and uh, with this oh, um, our friend uh, and his family, Timothy, and it didn't occur to me like a Timothy wasn't your typical. Russian immigrant name. So it, so I, I had heard things about his mother, but I really found out that during that vacation that, um, you know, she had grown up in Flatbush, Brooklyn, in this middle-class family, and um, 
she met his father, who was also uh, an American, um, in Moscow, and they had him and his brother, and then they disappeared, like so many Russians did, but also so many Americans, as it turned out. And so he, uh, he and his brother were shuffled around state orphanages, and he didn't meet his mother again for until he was a teenager, um, when his orphanage director, who he'd become very close to, uh, who was one-legged and not one-armed, like in the book. <laughs> right. uh, you know, he, he basically brought him together with his mother on a train platform when she was coming back from the gulag, which she had survived. And the first thing he suddenly remembered about her when she greeted him in Russian was her thick American accent. Like, he had, she had this Brooklyn accent that he had kind of whitewashed in his memory as a child because he was so little when, when she was taken from him. Um, his father didn't make it, unfortunately. And um, that scene became the first scene in the book. So I was very fortunate because um, at some point I said, you know, Timothy, I'd like to write a book about your mother and your family. And I didn't know how he would react, but he, um, he ended up sending me a box this thick of his mother's declassified KGB archives, uh, her interrogations. And um, he had gotten it sort of through indirect means, like a little bit of which I fictionalized in the book. Um, so I started kind of piecing it together from these um, from her interrogation files in the in the in the political prison, and um, a lot of it, you know, I had to fill in. But it's like doing a Sudoku puzzle almost. Like you kind of see the missing pieces, and you um, then you re you you go move you lean into them. So um, it gave me kind of an outline of her life, which I simplified somewhat because she had an even, an even more exciting life than the one that I wrote about. Uh, I mean, she had been all over the world and, um, but, um, and, and then, yeah, I, so I was living in, uh, I was, I was spending time in Moscow for a year, um, kind of going into the archives of, of Americans who had, um, had been there. There were quite a few because Moscow was like the, the New Jerusalem was like the Paris of the 1930s. A lot. I mean, here we had the Great Depression. We had, um, you know, people felt like Marxist predictions were coming true. Meanwhile, Russia seemed to be booming, right? And it was like buying up all American in technology and steel and industry. And so um, it turned out that all these workers had gone there to help build socialism. So I was like looking into that. And then I had an, a, a mentor who was a professor there. And his wife, it turned out, was a historian of childhood. It was kind of, and so she, I was uh, helping her translate some of her scholarly works, and she wrote a lot, quite a bit about orphanages. During um, there were just so many kids who were in orphanages after World War II because so many people had lost their parents, and um, I, I guess by the time I was writing, I was so familiar with so many parts of that of social history that I was able to write my characters into them. So. Um, yeah, and, 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 you know, I didn't actually, I asked Timothy a lot about his mother. I didn't ask him a ton about his own orphanage experience because I felt like it was so raw. Um, I knew a little bit about it. Right. Like he gave me some useful details. And then some of it I just sort of knew from just working with Tatiana and reading about it. And yeah. That is um, interesting. I, I interviewed a woman, her name is Helen Azar, and um, she wrote books, a lot of books, and she got the diaries of the Romanovs and translated them. Wow. Um, so I was thinking about like, you know, Russia has been in the news, but next year in 1918, I mean, and you know, because of 1918 being the 100th anniversary, Russia is going to be huge. Everybody's going That's back interesting. there. They're all do it, you know, for the Russian revolution thing. And she's got right. this whole like party set up to go back to Russia to experience this. And, and she's from Russia also, but I was, <laughs> it doesn't seem to amaze me how much, how people like continue to be fascinated by that part of the world. Like the, it's just, I, I don't know. I'm, I guess it's a good thing for a writer that people are really interested. Um, but yeah, people, Amer Americans especially. Just I think it's there's such a mirror image of us in so many ways that yeah. like they're endlessly interesting. Endlessly interesting. And, you know, you don't really, your accent is really like not, I expected your accent to be more Russian. I yeah, mean, you're, right, right, right. You do not. <laughs> I write with Maybe Max. it's your New York, you know, like it kind of all just... <laughs> It's easy, yeah. but well, how easy was it for her to get to get into Moscow in the 1930s? That's what I was thinking about. Yeah, it was fairly easy. I mean, um, okay. it was it was not uncommon for people to to go and work for a few years. It, it getting out was harder because mo by th before 36, 
Um, what happened was Russia was actually paying professionals in in gold and in foreign in foreign currencies to work there because it it like needed to grow so fast it just didn't have enough people to do the jobs needed like engineers and and um, but then you know, when Stalin really consolidated his power, they stopped paying in foreign currency. So a lot of people were like, eh, we're going back. But she was kind of, a, you know, a true believer. So she stayed. And then after 30, 37 was the year that, you know, everything sort of shut down. So um, I think I think just the group of friends who I have in the book, they kind of overstayed their, their welcome. That's really what happens. They're like, how could she stay? Well, like, she didn't want to. Um, but it's, it was unclear. I mean, I heard so many. I heard kind of conflicting uh, versions of her account. Like, like she, at one point she wanted to leave, but then when she was an older woman, she not only didn't want to leave, she didn't even want to say the word America. Right. She kind of she just said, "Oh, I, to, when her son was leaving, she said, you want that place." And I thought it was so interesting that this young woman who'd grown up until the age of twenty-five in the United States, like, couldn't say the name of the country of her birth, and it spoke to kind of cognitive dissonance that I, that was very familiar to me, like even from my grandfather, um, oh, really? just the way he talked. And I thought, you know, how do you go from being this person to being this other person? My grandfather was very secretive. Everything was in a, he's alive, actually, I shouldn't say was, he's in his 90s. Everything is kind of on a need-to-know basis. And the person that Timothy was describing was so familiar to me from like my, my own family that I felt like I wanted to do that psychological profile and that journey. You know, right? And and what is Russia like today? You know, I have this question. I have these questions, but it's like because I can ask you this. I mean, what is you? You came here. What what year did you get here? Nineteen eighty seven. Nineteen eighty seven. And what did you experience? Like when the difference now? Like, do you have a desire to go back? Like, do you like to visit? Do you like to you know? Or is it way better here now? Because I always get the sense that it's getting better there. You know, then- well, Mo- you know there's a- so all the money goes into Moscow, right? Moscow is always getting more beautiful uh, because kind of Russia um, channels a lot of its money into its- into Moscow's beautification. So even now, I mean, it-, it used to be quite congested. Now there are plans to make it like more of a pedestrian city with no traffic in the center. It's the the rest um, of Russia. You can't really say that for. It's changed a lot since sanctions. I haven't actually been there, been back there since the sanctions. And but I do have um, so you know I wrote about this kind of so part of the book is in 2008 and that was based on my living there and like having friends and just partying a lot, right. uh, and because there were a lot of foreigners working for um, international corporations there, so a lot of those people have gone back home since then since the book was written because um, a lot of foreign money has been pulled out of Russia since the sanctions. So um, and it's been kind of hard for some. Of, my friends, because it's like they're almost having to immigrate back because their business experience there doesn't translate into American experience. Like American companies don't even want to really hire them. Um, but I, I, I know, and I have some Russian friends who've also, who've also kind of come over since um, since the sanctions because it's just gotten tougher. It's gotten tougher overall. It, I think it's 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 really hit their economy. Um, it hasn't made them any less patriotic because yeah. like. When like it's it's interesting when when Russia suffer when the Russians suffer they just become more pro-Russian so there's that um, right <laughs> yeah <laughs> it makes sense though but and yet when you started writing this like you had no idea like all of a sudden Russia is in the news and it's this Russia like that I, like I said we don't really know and that's why we have so many questions because those of us in, especially in my age category were like wait, what is all the, you know, I didn't even understand that there was so much business going on, you know, like, because we don't hear about it. And then with, with Trump, it all kind of blows up and you're like, wait, how is Russia involved? Like, I didn't even picture that. And so it's really interesting, the timing of this book, because now everybody is really interested in knowing, especially about this time period, I think. Yeah, I mean, we've always, I mean, I think now it's actually the exception, we're doing less business than we usually did with them. Um, I mean, I thought it was interesting. Cause, well, you know? Right, because when I was, it was odd, because I started writing it when the world sort of um, uh, fell into a worldwide economic recession, right, right, 2008. And as I was reading about the social history, I was like, wow, am I just seeing this happening in my own life? Or am I projecting? And I realized I wasn't projecting, because, like, just as now, uh, on the front pages in the 30s, it was like the Red Menace, um, and, and they were saying, you know, 
Russians are meddling in our democracy through their agents in the common turn. Like, right? Sound familiar? Uh, they're spying on us. Like the <laughs> but then on the back end, there was there was millions of dollars of deals being made with like every major American company. So GE, Ford, Otis Elevator, Siemens Trailer, like everybody. A business was down here, so everybody was trading with them. And this was while we didn't formally acknowledge them as a government, right? So, like, we always had this um, bipolar re- right. relationship with them. We're on the front pages, we're, we're talking about the threat, and on the back end, back end, we're, we're making deals. Like, that to me wasn't new. It's just what's new now is that we're suddenly, there's suddenly a spotlight on that dynamic. Yes. Like, that's the only difference. Yes. I mean, maybe, yes. maybe, maybe it's more subtle than that, but like, yes. yeah. No, I, 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 I totally agree with that. And, but, okay, you are getting so many great reviews about this book. I mean, everybody is loving. I saw on Amazon, like, and I don't read them before I read the book. I go back and I was oh, like, oh. oh, they were just dead on. I mean, everybody is loving this. And, um, but, but like you said, I mean, this is a 500 page book and I'm usually, I usually shy away from them. I really do. I, I don't, I don't go looking for 500 pages books, but it read so fast. I've I heard that. I've heard it reads it. fast. It is. And I want to tell everybody, like if you're in the, if you're in Barnes and Noble and, and you see it because I didn't have to physically see it. It was more like I put it on my Kindle and my audio and I'm listening and going back and forth and you know, but if you see that book, don't shy away from it because it is a fast read. And I, it's hard to tell somebody that on a 500 page, but it is a very fast read. And that's a testament to your writing because the story just flows, you know, and you don't feel like you're laboring over any parts of it or too much detail or everything you put in there, the detail was necessary. It wasn't just fluff to fill pages, you know, like some people, you know, like some, a lot of authors do. I, I felt every part of it was so necessary. It's funny because it was actually the original draft was much longer. Like I feel like I, I, I feel like I can and and um, it, it, my, my editor actually pushed it till after the election because she's like, oh, there's just too much going on in the news cycle right now. We'll just we'll, we'll put it out when it's um quieter. But like <laughs> I, that didn't work out. But um, you know, it was just it was sort of so long that she took a she took a while because she was backlogged. And by the time that I kind of resubmitted it, I had um because. I didn't actually develop, so there's this, so her story sort of told in this omniscient narrator's voice. Right. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons it kind of flows fast because it's, you're in her head, but you're also sort of yes. in her world. Um, originally I had a lot more of it written in her son's voice, but um, as I just got more comfortable with the history and with her story, I, I snipped the two and I made them each their own story more because he had a journey as well. And, right. um, I think, like, I, I'm not sure I had the courage to write in the omniscient voice until I finished the book, and then I just rewrote it that way. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, um, and I know it's not your, I mean, you had another book, and um, what's the name? What, uh, what was one more year. One more year, yes. Uh, but that was short stories, correct? That was Yeah, yeah. So this yeah. was your first novel, historical novel, and um, so where do you go from here? I mean, okay, so this is, like, awesome and amazing, like, how do you, like, I'm sure you have to take a step back, and you're doing a lot of book tours, and I saw some of your um, things on YouTube, a lot of people are videoing you and putting you on YouTube, and yes, I go know check that out. Okay. And, um, uh, you know, like, do you take a break, or are you, or are you working on, you know, do you already have something else planned? Yeah, I have an idea, it's, I mean, I'm very superstitious about, like, talking anything, not because, um, like, I don't care about people stealing ideas. It's not like that. If, it's, if I say it, like, I won't be able to write it. Um, but, so, it's it's not going to be, a, the next one's not going to be as um, big. But it actually is also, I think, might be a, a two-part structure with um, two stories that echo each other. I, I'm feeling a little reticent about it because, um, like, I some people love, some readers love uh, a two-part structure where one story echoes off another. And some people get very... Um, puzzled by it. I, I mean, they, they get um, discombobulated and I, I don't know. I can't help it. Like, I think it's going to be, I, it's going to, it's going to have also an American storyline kind of about um, a, a, a period of recent history. And then um, um, it's, it's not going to be quite as historical. It's not going to be set in the present, present day, but it's going to be set in the, re, in the more recent past, I think. Um, I yeah. Think, you know, I do see that. I see critics from people saying, oh, I only like it in one, you know, critique people, people that are critiquing the book. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? I think it's so much richer. I always, always like it. There's, I can't remember a book that I've never liked a two 
or three. I can, you know, I like going deep. I don't care. I'll go, you know, five people voices because I think it lends to the story in different in a different perspective. Even the time, I was never confused. I loved it. I, oh, it's so great. <laughs> Well, it's, it's, it's interesting because it's the one thing you can do in literature. I mean, right. we have a lot of other narrative forms. We have TV and we have podcasts. And um, it's harder to make a statement about parallels, about like the rhyming action of history in those other forms. I mean, you, you it's been done really well by um, because I was just um, doing an interview with, with Lit Hub and I, and I realized I was saying that when you write historical fiction, it's almost like writing science fiction yes. because you're because you're exploring, um, you can't help it, you're exploring issues of relevance in our, to our own time in a yes. different era. I mean, and that's why we're reading it because it's like Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And, um, <laughs> yes. you know, yeah. and so when you, when you have more than one period, you really see that rhyming action. But um, you, I, I feel like if I'm going to, if you write books, why not do that? You can't really do that in other types of forms. Well, and exactly, and that's why I said this is a mini series to me because you can, they could dive into these, you know, different characters and and settings, and you know, I really hope you get it, and you please let me know if you do get it because oh my god, we, we can only wish, right? No, no, I, I, I mean, I'm happy that it's, I, I, I I'm not, a, I, I like, I like l language, you know, that's why I write books and not. Right. Um, Scripts, but um, I don't know. I think that's like I'm not gonna lie. I'm not gonna be like be above it. It's kind of like if right, it's someone like, else, make it sure. Definitely. Oh, well, right. it's so yeah. lovely to meet you. And can you hold the book up again? I'm gonna have all the links to Sana's um, social media and Amazon, so you can get that. I just I'm so, I I'm like yeah. gonna go buy it because see what I do right. is I do this and then I go buy the hardcover because I'm weird and then I store them and because it's beautiful. I Thank love you. the hardcover. It's I'm actually I'm actually not on social media anymore. I'm I'm, I'm not on Facebook, but I, I still have a website, sonographic.com. Just like it just really are you on Twitter? Um, I'm not on anything. Uh, <laughs> I just I, I got I have two little kids. I got I, my husband's also he's a radio reporter, so we work a lot. Too. I just I realized I don't have time. I'm, well, you know I what's can't. funny is my daughter's listening to this. My older I have six children. My oldest son edits ah. these for me. I couldn't do it without him. So we'll just thank right. you. And then my oldest daughter, uh, she has two little children also, but she does all my social media. Yeah, that's such a great reason to have kids, right? When right. I'm older, my kids can do whatever like virtual work. media there is, you know, <laughs> next 20 years. Except that's you awesome. You can't like, bug them because they got lives. So you have to be like, please, whenever you get a chance, you know. And, but she, I look on, uh, every morning I wake up, my social media is always like, I've got like 15 notifications because she works all the time. Like she just does it on her phone. And she gets all these, all this stuff out there, and and so thank you, Kara. That's <laughs> amazing. You have a great, you have great kids. I, don't think, I, hope my, I hope my kids are that um, are like free assistants when I get older. Well, you know, my oldest son said for all the work. Took on my editing, <laughs> I had somebody else doing my editing, and my son was like, "Oh my god, mom, that's horrible. I can do better." And I was like, "Really? Thank you. I would love it." And he's like, "You taught me how to eat with a spoon. I'll edit your videos." I'm like, "Oh." That's so cute. So. Oh, <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so, so much. Yeah, but anyway, well, then I'm not going to have many links, but yes, go to your website. I love your website. It's all interactive. Everybody can find out everything about you. It links to Amazon. I will put your Amazon link so everybody can get your book. And, right. um, and you will love it. Don't be deterred by the pages. It is a fast read, and you will love it. So please keep in touch and let me know what's going on with whatever your next book and you know we'll chat again thanks so much michelle okay thank Be you well. have a great day okay. bye <laughs>